Rich Report, a podcast with news and information on high-performance computing. Today, my guest is from Clustered Systems Company, Incorporated. We have Phil Hughes, who's the CEO of the company. So, uh, Phil, welcome to the show today. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, nice to be here. So, Phil, I, I brought your slides up, so um, you know, why don't you tell us what you're going to tell us? Okay. Uh, well, I'd, li- I'd like to sort of step back a minute before I really get into the details of uh, what we're making. As you can see from the first slide, we're making a 100-kilowatt rack. But only the question comes, well, why did we want to do that? So uh, moving to slide two, uh, we took a, a holistic look, if you like, maybe over were, um, overused, but you can see that when you start looking at the service from a point of view of power, cooling, uh, just about everything that goes into the facilities plus the server itself, you see there's, there's a lot to uh, not like about having a rack full of uh, one new servers. Everything that is except the price. And this is like a, if you're like a, a little village that's just grown. Uh, bits have been placed on top of other bits and you've basically got an agglomeration of stuff that, yeah, does the job, but it does it in a pretty complex way and not particularly efficiently. So if we map that onto a good old spider's chart that you've probably been familiar with over the years, you can see that uh, it really doesn't do very well. Um, It's okay on price, as we said before, not particularly green, because every time you do something, you have to throw a chunk away. Networking, well, it works okay. Reliability is not too bad. Cooling could be a lot better, and, of course, power, it was power just about everywhere. So... What what was the next step? Basically, let's try Blaze. Um, still, power wasn't fixed. Um, cooling wasn't fixed. Put larger fans in. That helped a little bit. Uh, but we did get a little bit some redundant power. But still the same old network, maybe a little bit of um, concentration within the, uh, the blade enclosure itself. But all the rest really stayed the same. But the bright spot was we had some consolidated management. And, of course, it is green because you can keep the closure and power supplies and um, just replace the blades, so, which, is, which is pretty good, but maybe there's more to be done there eventually. Um, and then, of course, you've got to have the, the, the facilities are still the same as with, uh, with RAC. You still need to have uh, the facilities, and then it's now proprietary, so really the price goes up. So, again, then moving to five, you see that um, power is better, cooling, reliability, all of it better, and even a bit green. But again, price is a problem. Um, facilities are a bit better because you can actually use slightly smaller facilities. Okay, so that's where we believe we stand at the moment. So what did we think we could do? So, we said, well, first of all, the, the power. Um, Let's change that. Let's let's see what we can do by getting 12 kilovolts to 12 volts DC as quickly as possible. We'll talk about how we did that. Um, and then, obviously, high temperature cooling is really a buzzword today. Um, uh, Intel recently announced uh, 100 Fahrenheit. Uh, we reckon we can uh, we can do that, and probably a lot more reliably, and probably higher as well. Um, cooling clearly no uh, with refrigerant and uh, our direct touch cooling there is no hot spots and obviously no fans for reliability same same as blades uh, the network we're doing something that uh, is very exciting we believe and we're using a an integrated PCI Express network to connect all the servers within a rack or well, in fact in multiple racks and uh, the software now exists to do this from one of our partners. Um, we can uh, transfer memory to memory in, in hardware times of um, a few tens of nanoseconds. Um, so that really is going to make a big difference in HPC networks. And obviously, we can also do I.O. sharing, which, again, saves a bunch of power. Um, then, 
of facilities. Because everything is integrated in the rack, you can put these racks wherever you have a little bit of protection from the weather and you have power available. Um, the cooling can be some, something uh, as simple as a dry cooler, adiabatic cooler, or a water tower. They will, you do not need any, uh, any chillers. And uh, in fact, one of the recent things that we, we just checked out was that um, we could run um, some 130 watt chips from a well-known supplier um, at uh, a full turbo boost at um, a 30 degrees C, and we still had a heck of a lot of room to take it over to probably 40 or 50 degrees C cooling. So we're very excited about that. And um, obviously, we, we're positioning this as, a, as an open platform. Uh, so we expect uh, other partners to develop blades and uh, other pieces to go into it with multiple suppliers so that we can keep the cost uh, way down. So moving again on to the 100 kilowatt rack itself, in overview, um, it's got AT, ATU blades. Each blade can have uh, two um, half-wide servers. Uh, then it is non-invasive. Uh, what we use effectively is uh, uh, coal plates which sit on top of the servers. We'll come back and talk a bit more about that. And then we're taking 480 volts AC convert in a series of rectifiers uh, to 380 volts and then distribute that to each of the server motherboards, or to the blades, rather, where it is then converted uh, to 12 volts. So, so effectively, you've got a transformer from 12 kilovolts to 480 volts. Uh, you've got another, uh, another rectifier step, and then uh, one more conversion to, to 12 volts. So much, much better efficiencies there. And of course, as we've talked about before, it's an open. And very, very key is that all electronics are field replaceable. So anything in the box can be taken out and removed with uh, the minimum of tools or no tools. So moving on to slide number nine. Uh, this shows a, uh, a specific enclosure. Um, the 16 blades, as I mentioned before, one to two circuit boards. And in the back, we have uh, what we call active planes. And the whole thing has got uh, about 20 kilowatts of power. And as you can see on the, on the left, uh, that's one of our partners there. They've supplied the power distribution unit uh, for the enclosure. That's Pandwick. Then on um, number 10, just shows a bit of the architecture. It's a sketch for, from the back for, uh, for clarity with everything there. You can't see too much, but you can see the uh, four active planes that are orthogonal to the blades. Uh, so those provide um, a redundant switching between um, all, the, all the blades, uh, the, the servers actually in the system. Um, moving on to uh, number 11, this shows the, the principle of how this thing gets cooled. Um, we have very, very thin cold plates. They're about two, cent uh, two millimeters thick, and we circulate a refrigerant through those. Those then sit on top of uh, the components, which uh, have essentially heat rises on top of them that planarizes the the, uh, the box, so the heat all comes up to a single level, or almost a single level, and then we have a, a special layer that we put between the cold plate and the, the components themselves, which uh, absorbs any irregularities. And the whole thing, obviously, is, is, uh, is compatible with uh, existing technology from, um, from Liebert. So the so this is the, the first blade we've uh, produced. This, was, this goes by our, our code name of Dune Buggy. And um, it takes 380 volts DC in and uh, has uh, four uh, processors, four E5 processors. And as I mentioned earlier, we've done some, um, some testing on this now. We've, we've started doing some fairly detailed testing. Um, yesterday, we were up at uh, 30 degrees C. Um, and uh, everything was going uh, with uh, max power at um, 
uh, 3.2 uh, gigahertz um, uh, with no with absolutely no throttling. So we're very very pleased about that. Um, the next slide, number 13, shows um, one of the PCI Express uh, switch planes. It's uh, it's using 2.0 at this point. Um, in spite of the fact that all the connectors and everything on the board is actually set up for uh, 3.0, and it also has gigabit Ethernet on there for management. Uh, then moving on to just a little bit about hot water cooling. Um, I think I mentioned most of this before. Uh, heat comes off the chip through a riser into the cold plate, um, then into the XDP, and then into um, and then the which is cooled in turn either by an adiabatic cooler or maybe even wastewater from your existing system. So you take water out of your um, computer room uh, air handler and use that. So that's that's a, a great way to reuse uh, the water, extract more cooling from it, and increase your uh, chiller efficiency all at the same time. So we reckon we get a, a true PUE of about 1.10. Um, then remember that that uh, includes the fact that we've absolutely got no fans at all. So if you're talking about a PUE of an existing server uh, and you remove the fans, even if you've got if you sit in the in the middle of a field, it's really it's PUE is about 1.1 because about 10% of the energy even at um, at idle goes to uh, just goes to cooling if it gets hot then maybe as much as 40 percent of the energy goes for cooling so moving on to uh, 16 a very very quick example of um, of a 20-foot container um, if 40 kilowatts worth of uh, power and cooling in um, the, a single 20-foot and at a, le a cost less than $1,000 per server. Um, and that leads on to a, a cost calculation that we uh, derived actually from a, uh, a white paper from HP. Um, they were discussing um, the site facility development of about $58 million for about 3.2 megawatts of data. Um, they're also modular. They they reckon they could cut it in two, and uh, we think that we can cut that down by another third uh, when we use um, a bunch of containers uh, to do the same thing. Uh, corresponding, we have uh, energy savings and also a reduced uh, water cost. Um, so once it really this thing has to be supported by a number of suppliers and we've been very fortunate to have recruited a, quite a number as you can see from this uh, next file number 18. Um, Intel and Inforce have both got uh, motherboards that will work in the system. DIM uh, Smart Modular has developed some DIMs with um, heat risers to our specifications. Um, One Stop Systems has got the PCI Express uh, interconnect. Uh, being very efficient. Um, Emerson has supplied um, 380 volt power supplies, pan with the distribution. And then, of course, the, the racks, um, Emerson Network Power are providing the plumbed racks uh, with, the, with the, all the piping for the refrigerant in there. Uh, we also have another one in the, in the works we can't talk about yet. Uh, cooling, obviously, we've designed that. And then the, uh, the blades we're talking to a few people to deliver uh, whole blades. In the meantime, we'll deliver, we'll integrate it, Intel and Enforce into the blades and uh, make those available. And all of this really does have some pretty interesting applications. Um, when this product uh, comes to market, it really will change quite a number of things in the environmental systems, because now you're really reducing the cost of, of facility construction. Um, and you really decouple from, from industry, the infrastructure, um, because now you don't need to put in uh, large uh, cooling systems with all the air ducting, chillers, 
um, sensors, what have you. It's essentially a box that is um, is plumbed to a, uh, a heat disposal unit somewhere else. And obviously this is, as you don't have to build a new building or retrofit uh, an existing one, then that's going to reduce lead times to getting your system up and running from uh, from years to weeks. And again, that again is going to have some interesting changes in the dynamics of uh, how an organization is going to plan for its, its future as well. And you know, this, and from the electronic point of view, you're going to see, we believe, some some further consolidation and um, integration of all more features into the box. Because with something like PCI Express, you can now put, in, uh, include instead of just server blades, you can put, let's say, um, disk drives, um, maybe even uh, router functions into the same box and interconnect these and make them available as peripherals to to your service. So it, it produces some interesting new uh, architectural concepts. And then, of course, as far as the user is concerned, it's, uh, it should be all goodness, because reducing lead times means that um, you're going to have the ability to wait almost until the last minute before you can um, before you have to, to buy or expand your facility rather than have to plan it years in advance. So, so that's where we stand today. Uh, we feel that uh, this has got a, um, this potentially can be a game changer but is totally compatible uh, with existing systems and can fit right into data centers that are available today or are in existence today, and in fact, our first our first employment will be in an existing data center and will be using uh, liquid uh, liquid coming from existing um, equipment. So we'll be using already warm fluid to to cool our systems. So in closing, uh, the summary just uh, gives a, a very brief picture of what we've talked about. Essentially, this is an open system. Uh, it's really a mechanical and cooling framework. Uh, we've provided a, a, set, a first set of electronics that we feel that would, would also be very attractive um, to uh, to kick the uh, the system off. But in future, we would see a mix and match of uh, both switches and blades um, of all types, um, including uh, GPU storage, maybe even routers we talked about. Um, but it's very important that we also make this thing, everything field replaceable and simply field replaceable. So effectively, uh, removing these things virtually in a, in a toolless way. And then um, with the latest processes, we would expect that um, uh, $20 million per petaflop uh, all included, and that's, inc that's including the facilities for what they are as well as um, the uh, electronics hardware. Uh, now then, if there are any questions, I'd be uh, happy to hear them, Rick. Sure, sure, Phil. So uh, why don't you tell us more about the company? Uh, you know, what's, what's your history and, and what were you doing uh, prior to this? Okay. Um, my history goes back um, somewhere. It's, it's, uh, my last company, we raised a, uh, a lot of money, in the, uh, actually over $100 million, uh, to build a, a very, very high-performance uh, switching system, uh, 2.5 terabit per second switching. And during that, we discovered an aha moment uh, that we were spending something like 95% of the money that we raised on doing stuff, stuff that other people had done. So when we started this next company, we said, well, we will focus on the things that we really want to do, um, which is figure out what, the, what is needed and then design it and then use other people's channels to bring it to market. So effectively, Clustered Systems is a, um, is a company that uh, develops products and then develops partnerships to bring these things to market. Uh, for this... Um, 
the company has been in existence for four years. Uh, we initially developed a rack-based cooling system, uh, which we then licensed to uh, Liebert, and that is now available from Liebert under the designation of XDS. And um, most recently, we uh, got a grant from uh, Department of Energy of uh, $3 million to develop the system we've talked about today. Uh, there are um, three of us at the moment, um, full-time employees, uh, plus um, several uh, part-time people that are helping us out, plus, of course, all the companies we, we talked about. Sure. And so uh, do you expect to GA this this product uh, sometime in 2012? Yes. Uh, we're expecting to um, put the first product in um, Stanford Linear Accelerator uh, probably start of uh, second quarter. As you, you as you may know, there's, some, there's been some interesting availability issues with uh, hard disk and other things recently. Uh, but that's the that's the goal, and GA will probably be about media. So, Phil, could you characterize the what kind of customer would be interested in this? Is it just about having the highest density per square foot of floor space, or or are there other things involved? Oh, absolutely, other things. In fact, the the, de the density is a uh, one of the good things that comes about. But really, when we started all of this, what we were really looking at is uh, how how to get things closer uh, together so that we could uh, provide an efficient interconnect. And then that really got us involved in how do we cool this thing. Um, that then led to developing a, a um, highly energy efficient cooling system, which is the which is really the main goal of the. The whole exercise, and then we 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 uh, we see that the, all these other benefits in uh, accrue. So you get you get better cooling, which means higher density. Um, if the and also it, it eliminates chillers, it eliminates noise, makes things simpler simpler to service, reduces lead times because now you don't need to develop expensive facilities, and and it just goes on and on. There are just so many advantages to this type of system that essentially takes it from from power in to heat out um, essentially in, in virtually a single box. The first customer that we would expect are obviously in the HPC area and that's that's I, I think I wouldn't be talking out of place if um, we mentioned that that Intel is that's one of the areas that Intel is very interested in because processors will not be getting cooler and this this uh, this system can can handle a processes uh, well north of 200 watts. Let's put this 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 rack in perspective, because uh, uh, I I came from Sun Microsystems and I remember having a conversation maybe five years ago about a, a forty kilowatt rack, and the guys from engineering looked at us like we were mad, right? That we needed this. This thing is considerably bigger. Uh, what kind of challenges does that present? Um, to the facilities people that would be um, ha having to deal with this this box or the electrical guys. Well, as far as the well, the facilities people at at Stanford are pretty excited about having this in because and they've not they, they don't seem to have any difficulties with um, incorporating this in their environment. In fact, um, our initial thought over there was to put it in a in one of the uh, old uh, cyclotron huts that had uh, lots and lots of power and um, and uh, I think it was uh, water tower cooling but then uh, the the which would have been ideal because it would have been a very very simple um, interconnect to ex existing power but here it's uh, 480 volts is is available just about everywhere these days and um, 
as we've talked about before, cooling is very simple, so there's there's no real issues um, around incorporating this in existing or new facilities. Well, terrific. So, Phil, you've been working on this thing for a while. Um, what was the toughest nut to crack once you had it on the drawing board? Um, let's see. I think the the, um, the one of the big challenges was uh, uh, two, well, actually two things, which are really the core innovations here. Uh, one was making very, very thin, flexible coal plates. And the other one was uh, developing a, a thermal interface uh, to go between the heat rises and the and the coal plate itself, because as you know, um, uh, circuit boards are not mechanically very precise. You know, heights of components vary; their orientation varies slightly. So you have to be able to accommodate all of that in a in a very simple, low cost way. And those are the two challenges that we uh, the, the two biggest challenges that we met. Um, I think the, the uh, everything else has been relatively smooth, um, you know, uh, apart from you know our, our partners have been really excellent and very very supportive. So we couldn't have uh, we couldn't have wished for a better crew. Well, Phil, this is really exciting, and I, I think I should uh, congratulate you on this as an engineering accomplishment. Well, thank you very much. Well, sure, Phil. I guess, you know, we've got a lot of readers and listeners out there uh, that are HPC users. And if they're interested in this product, um, how should they get in touch? Uh, give me a call. It's uh, probably the most direct thing. And I can uh, I can then point them at, uh, at people that, that can actually then fill their, fill their needs because we're we're in discussions with uh, quite a few people about um, how to bring this into market. So um, we would expect that we will have uh, partners op offering systems towards the end of this year that well, will not, not be clustered because we'll, we'll be doing market seeding, but we won't be delivering high volumes of these things. I see. I we see. want these really to come from, from uh, the OEMs who've got the channels and the skill set to, uh, to provide the whole thing. We're a small company. We intend to stick to our knitting and uh, and develop uh, exciting new product and then get them to market through uh, existing channels. Well, terrific. Well, Phil Hughes from uh, Clustered Systems, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. You're very welcome. Thank you for your time. You bet. Okay, folks, that's it for the Rich Report. Stay tuned for more news and information on high-performance computing.